Welcome to Kendall and Cooper Talk Mysteries. I'm Julie Cooper, a mystery and thriller writer and half of the duo bringing you this regular podcast series. I know Wendy's anxious to introduce our guest, but first, a quick thank you to my brother Chris Squires for his original composition and performance of our theme song, The Man in the Panama Hat. Over to you, Wendy. Thanks, Julie. Well, I'm a cozy mystery lover, but I do love all mysteries. And today I'm thinking about the dark side of mysteries, often beleaguered protagonists. A great place to go to explore heroes with villainous flaws is noir mysteries. The Mysterious Bookshop in New York City is the oldest and largest mystery specialist bookstore in the world. It's run by Otto Penzler, a mystery author and editor. He says that noir is about losers. He says these characters may not die, but they probably should, and they deserve it. Wow! He adds that he loves noir fiction. It makes doom fun. Lots of readers love noir in books, also in film, and on TV. It has resurfaced in popularity a few times since it began, and I wonder what triggers that. And I think its popularity is having a resurgence now. Our guest today may have some insights into that. Ooh la la, I'm drinking my, my Paris blend tea today. Because our guest is a Francophile, who visits Paris as often as she can and sneaks that city into much of her writing, just like in her noir travel story, Revenge in Paris, or as I like to shortcut it, R.I.P. Her work has appeared in Scent of Cedars, Promising Writers of the Pacific Northwest, and also in France, A Love Story. Her awards include a grant from the Elizabeth George Foundation, the Monticello Award for Fiction, and also a variety of writing residencies. She was fiction editor at Northwest Review, served on the board of directors for Oregon Writers Colony, and co-founded the acclaimed Willamette Writers Speakers Series. Here's an author who writes five-star noir. Bonjour and bienvenue, Valerie J. Brooks. Well, that's quite an introduction, Wendy. Thank you so much. Hello, Wendy. Hello, Julie. So nice to be on this podcast with you both. We're excited to be talking with you. I know Julie's going to dive right in with a bunch of questions she's got. Okay. I am. I'm ready, Julie. I hope you're ready. Okay. Go for it. Valerie, you've said on your website, which I really enjoyed, by the way, I write about strong, intelligent, gutsy women who make mistakes and have lots of baggage because, as the saying goes, well-behaved women seldom make history or good novels. My question to you is, shouldn't the reader expect our female protagonist to be strong, gutsy, and intelligent by now? Well, wouldn't you think so? But unfortunately, the way things are going lately, it seems like... uh, Some people are trying to put us back in the box, and I don't think we're going to go there very easily. So the protagonist in noir, which I love, and I know both of you have seen, uh, probably seen Body Heat. Oh, yeah. Um, Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, well, that's the type of woman I really like to depict. (laughs) I I think it has something to do with the fact that you have these men that are just lusting after a woman for all the physical reasons and they haven't got a clue what's going on and in in that one um maddie the protagonist i think of her as the protagonist either even though you know the male is set up as the protagonist he's actually just the fall guy so he is yes and so for me i and i'll i'll switch back and forth talking about both both novels and film, because I studied uh, film noir, and that's how I did get my um, lust for noir. And (laughs) in in that, when I saw Maddie as that character, I thought, now here's an intelligent woman who, and we'll talk about this later, I know, because you have some questions about it, but 
noir always comes out of the motive of some type of desire. And the desire might have really good pinnings at first with some people or some of the protagonists and then go askew because, well, we all get carried away. <laughs> so, <laughs> so women, I think, are tell, I, I don't think women have been represented that well in noir at the beginning during the hardcore, you know, noir because they were either represented as femme fatales or they were represented as, oh, say, good little housewives who are always saying to their, <laughs> saying to the pro male protagonist, but honey, aren't you going to stay home with me and Jimmy? You know, something like that. Right, so, the typical archetypes. Right, the different archetypes in noir to begin with, particularly when it's, you know, Noir started in 1946, or at least that's when it was the term was coined. And so I saw too many of those. I love the movies. Uh, I have no problem with the early movies or the novels because I love James Kane. Oh, just love him. And I love Ross MacDonald. And I, and I love a lot of the different male writers. But uh, my favorite noir writer is actually Dorothy Hughes. She's just phenomenal. She wrote In a Lonely Place. So I like the female characters that are presented in a contemporary fashion. And that's why I created Angeline and uh, RIP. <laughs> great. Great. No, I, you, that is right, Julie. I mean, I think as a thriller writer, you're a thriller writer. You, yes. You know what it's like to create female characters who are contemporary. There, you know, maybe some are st still femme fatales, but, Women are intelligent. They're usually m moving the men around on the chessboard. <laughs> I'm probably going to get a lot of crap for that one. But anyway, oh, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Not from us. Not, Not okay. from us. Not <laughs> now, you've also said writing mysteries was for good girls. Noir was for bad, which I dearly love. Uh, so I'm I'm wondering what that does say about me if I write thrillers. But, but anyway, um, I often <laughs> think of noir... <laughs> Julie. <laughs> <laughs> As a more nostalgic look at crime fiction in some ways, which pays a tribute to the hard boiled mysteries of the forties and fifties and, and even wonderful films like Chinatown. Would this would this be an accurate assessment? Yes, I mean noir usually I mean it is crime fiction. And so I think the difference between perhaps and I'm just you know, I read thrillers also, is that they Thrillers at least give you an ending that, that you know, feels good in some certain way because usually the protagonist wins. Right. Something happens. But, you know, if you look at the Scandinavian writers of noir, like, you know, the girl with the, you know, dragon tattoo or something like that, you're yes. looking at really dark, dark um, thrillers. Bleak. But, they're bleak. <laughs> they're bleak. And they're so bleak, though. But what it is, and this is this is something you don't hear that often about noir. Noir really comes out of dark times. And that's why I think I started writing noir, because I was trying to write, you know, novels for women that I thought were contemporary and also effective in my own viewpoint of what was going on politically, culturally, you know society wise and one of the things i found was it's getting bleaker all the time so <laughs> I, I i thought what a great way of you know like this is exactly what happened in 1946 when noir became a coined phrase is we started entering a place where the men were coming back from war yes and came back from war that Everyone had this, you know, incredible, like, you know, American dream idea. But the problem was war doesn't leave you, you know, when you come home. And the women had been working in jobs they wanted to stay in. And so there was an incredible, um, even though we, even though that Hollywood was putting out these, in, you know, like lovely, you know, uh, films that depicted us as a great nation and what you know what we accomplished was great but also underneath it things weren't going so good so we started getting a lot of noir that ha featured um veterans who came back who were unhappy or couldn't find their place 
Then the McCarthy era hit, and there was the second major push with noir. Where uh, uh, okay, that was where noir really took off in a form that said, well, of course, you know, the Hollywood Hollywood was getting hit hard, and the big moguls didn't they didn't want anything to do with it, so they tried to separate themselves out. So a lot of the different writers and directors were basically kicked out and they had to find other ways of doing what they loved to do. And one thing was noir is, was cheap. It was inexpensive to film. And you had a lot of fiction that was coming up that people were grabbing onto and saying, we could make this lighting is like the most expensive thing that goes on in film. So lighting could be cheapened because it was dark. <laughs> you could- <laughs> Just have one spotlight on it and get away with it. So you'll see a lot of the different things that were simple to do. Like if you look at introductions to film noir, and I'm bringing up images because a lot of times you don't see these in the in no, noir novels. Sure. Without being, without having your brain triggered to look for them, it's all subliminal, and it's like the checkerboard floor, the black and white, you know, squares. That looks like a checkerboard. That is another way of manipulating your mind to think of game. Or Venetian blinds throwing lines down um, on an introduction where you, it feels like prison because you have these, you know, lines across bars. Across bars, yes, yeah. bars. Okay. So a lot of little imagery, imaging things that, you know, really it's atmosphere in noir, just like in thrillers. And even in cozies, when you know you have to set up a atmosphere for the cozy to make people feel safe, that everything's going to work out okay. Yes, absolutely. We, yes, in cozies, we keep the Venetian blinds open. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you have beautiful curtains, you know. <laughs> yes, yes, just enough so that we can see what the neighbors are doing. That's right. Uh-huh. <laughs> This was giving me a whole new insight into cozies as voyeurs or something. <laughs> Julie, they're just sneakier. That's all. I okay. <laughs> all right. Now, you've mentioned, Valerie, in your blog about the writing process and that you consider yourself a behavioral diagnostician, which I found fascinating. In other words, the why or the motive, it sounds like, is the thing that drives your writing and your characters. And you've touched on that briefly in your introduction, but can you tell us a little bit more about that? I think it's due to my love of psychology. Um, I think I might have read the whole book of the, you know, the, um, you know, mental disorders. (laughs) I think of, I think of so many times when um, the real people I've met and my first instinct is to diagnose them um Ah. so when i talk to people it's how their eyes meet you your eyes how they if they have any um like what they say in gambling any tells you know where yes you know you, you get a little tick when something happens i love watching people and observing them that's usually what creates my first character is i come up with a person or a person comes to me and I know that sounds really weird, but it's not, you know, I'm sure that you've dealt with this before. Um, the author Sandra Brown said, Oh no, I can't, I cannot, she can't outline. She says, no, a a character shows up and basically is a certain way. And it's like, for me, I make an analogy. It's like having a friend, a new friend. And that person you think can be a, good friend and you want to know more about them but it takes a long time to get to know them so it's the same way with developing a character I want to have as much fun writing so that my readers have as much fun reading because if it's all laid out sometimes I feel like well it doesn't allow for something really incredible to happen which is what happened in the first RIP in, in Revenge in Paris that totally blew me away i had no idea that was going to happen <laughs> right which i can't give away because i'd give a spoiler no 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 spoilers here no. okay i can tell you though no. it blew me away too <laughs> oh, I, I 
was so happy to hear that when you told me that because <laughs> I do have a mystery writer, a reader friend who said she knew. Oh, and no way. I went, well, okay. I, you know, I have to believe her because she's yeah. a friend of mine. But yeah. So I think that's it, Julie. I think that's really what, what gives me that. Um, that's why I love noir. I really like to get down into the lower levels, you know? <laughs> Good. 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 Well, yeah, we're liking it too. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think both of you are, have that same. There's a there's a motive right there. Your desire to create the types of either characters that you love or the characters that come to you, but also I think it's another another way of saying, well, okay, my mother had it really. My mom, she just recently departed, and she ha she said three years ago. You were just a good girl who wanted to be bad. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, that's great. I found a way to do it now. <laughs> right, right. That doesn't end up with you in jail. So that's, that's all good. <laughs> okay. Now, you've also mentioned that you've done a lot of writer's residencies. And I know you did one at Hedgebrook, which is a program specifically for women writers. Could you tell our listeners how you got involved and selected and what that experience was like for you? Oh, that was that was the very first residency I ever had. I was just, uh, I was green, uh, naive, but I did, and I think it was the second year that Hedgebrook uh, was offering residencies. So I applied. Their application process is very um, targeted to women who haven't had the opportunity to write and I'd been a working mom and I you know I I didn't have the time to write even though I, I was writing late at night you know whenever I could sneak it in sure but, but being a mom and working just didn't allow for being a novelist at that point for me so I started writing but then I came up with an idea for a novel and I wrote uh, I don't know I, I think it was like an 1989 or 91 somewhere around there and I just filled out the application not knowing that this Hedgebrook was going to become the best place for women who had been either disadvantaged in some way um, were trying to get their stories out particularly women of color um, uh, the LGBT you know everybody in that arena the funny right. thing was all the women that were there with me, you could consider us sort of white middle class women the first time around because uh -huh. we actually could find things like that and were, um, I think I found it online or through a friend of mine. So, you know, we had advantages where we could find these options. And when we were there, Nancy Nordoff, who was the founder of Hedgebrook, walked in on one of our uh, critique groups one night and said, well, this isn't exactly the group I was looking for. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Well, well, yeah, but Nancy was being facetious, of course. And yeah. Said, but we'll get the ball rolling, you know. And she really was looking for people who were, you know, who needed a, a step up in their, you know, in their writing career. So it was a, a terrific, a terrific advantage for me because, as I said in the application, I was a single mom. Yeah, it was easy, and it also wasn't the type of thing that comes, you know, that you can just oh, I can just go off for a month. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. But it's all free. They take such good care of you. In fact, the second day I was there, I cried like a baby. It was so. I mean, can you imagine your breakfast is given to you in a basket? They bring your lunch in a basket and put it at put it outside your cabin, you go down at night, you're fed. I mean, you're basically taken care of like a, a child. And when's the last time you had that happen? For a whole <laughs> Never. <month>. Never. <laughs> so apply, apply. But anyway, yeah, it was, it was, it was something that gave me true, oh, true grit as far as becoming a writer. I wanted to after that. So. Okay. And it also sounds, if, I, if I'm understanding correctly, it almost sounds in a way that it gave you not only a little validation, but permission as a woman to pursue writing seriously. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. A lot of times it's, 
Well, you know what it's like. People either ask you when you say you're a, a writer, and we have to start saying we're authors. Um, when you're a writer, they they say, oh, either I had someone say once, oh, another writer. <laughs> like, oh, no. Oh, oh, no. Or, and, and that's not a great way to get started, you know, as far as when people say those things to you, you kind of feel like, oh, I guess that's not very worthy. Right. Or or they say, oh, have you published yet? Mm -hmm. So so my, I would love to give some guidance to people out there and say, you know, if you run into somebody who's writing, just say, well, what a wonderful thing. Do you, would you like to tell me a little bit about what you write? Or, you know, just yes. curious about it. But don't do the, the you know, those just dismissive of kind of. Yeah, it's dismissive, Julie. That's exactly what it's it is. dismissive. Yeah, I've had I've had people say, you know, when they find out I, I write and they say, oh, yeah, I'm thinking about writing a book, too, but I just can't find the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, well, well, then you're I, not writing. You're really I, not writing. Yeah, you also hit a soft spot there. Because <laughs> so, I would say that person probably has thought about it and can't and wants, you know, doesn't want to hear about you <laughs> well often that's the case yeah. and speaking of hearing would you do us the honor of giving us a short reading from revenge in paris for our listeners sure i'd love to we'd um, love to hear it okay well it's good because um i have my i have my tea which i'm going to take a sip of and then i'm going to read the first um section of revenge in paris that way everyone can understand and also revenge in paris is on it's online and it's free it's the first part of a trilogy so angeline's story so anybody who wants to read it if you if you feel you know like ooh, that sounds good go for it you know it's on all the platforms too so okay. wonderful as I walked down Boulevard de Grenelle, I was tired, cranky, and not used to being stared at. The blonde wig I wore over my usual brunette bob caused my scalp to sweat and itch. And where was the seasonal weather? Around noon, three days before Christmas, and I was wearing sunglasses, a lightweight coat, scarf, and a silk dress. I never wore dresses. Paris in winter, and it was sunny and cool. Better than freezing rain, I told myself but freezing rain would have better fit my mood. My arm ached from hauling my carry-on behind me and slinging it on and off the train, then up and down the metro stairs. I didn't care. The metro had become my ally, reminding me of why I'd come to Paris. Above entrances and exits hung the same large photo of Marilyn Monroe, an advertisement for a Halsman photography exhibit at the Jeux de Palme. Monroe sits cross-legged and gorgeous on the floor, barefoot, naked shoulders, bra strap hanging, head bent over a book. So much like my sister Sophie, so vulnerable, so precious. You wanted to wrap a blanket around her and say, come with me, anything to keep her from ever being hurt again. But I hadn't wrapped that blanket around Sophie, and now my sister was dead. Another metro line clattered overhead. I shivered as my energy waned and my spirit sank into the gray of the neighborhood, the lack of holiday lights, the doubts of whether or not I could pull this off. The 15th arrondissement was unfamiliar to me. When Hank and I stayed in Paris years before, we'd rented apartments in the Marais, a more upscale area. This was a working class neighborhood, even though it was only a 10 minute walk to the Eiffel Tower. I probably wouldn't have chosen this arrondissement if I had the choice, but the Frenchman lived here and he'd killed my sister. He'd also killed my unborn niece or nephew. A man stopped to appraise me. I shoved past him and walked by three souvenir shops. From one shop, the song Hotel California played on a cheap boombox. I hated that song. As I approached a neighborhood supermarket, the Franc Prix, a beggar dressed in the saddest Santa outfit I'd ever seen sat on the sidewalk and held out his paper cup. He looked up at me. I glanced away and hurried past. The apartment was somewhere nearby. I couldn't wait to take off the wig and all the makeup, too. 
foundation, blush, eyeshadow, eyeliner, mascara, the works. I never wore this crap and felt as phony as that Santa suit. When you work at a law firm like mine, conservative dress is a given. I preferred to call it classic, but I wasn't in Paris as me, Angeline Porter. I was here as journalist, Helen Craig. I searched for the address of my apartment, square de sac, square de sac, where the hell was it? I found the street where the flower shop on the corner was decorated for the season. That brightened my mood a little. I turned up the dead end road and found the address, rang the bell and was greeted by the guardian, a concierge of sorts. She gave me the key. I remembered little French, but I managed. When I tried to cram into the phone booth size elevator with my carry-on, I couldn't. So I put my suitcase on the elevator, pressed the three button, and walked up the curved staircase to meet the elevator and my suitcase on the third floor. After I unlocked the heavy door, I stepped into a three-room apartment, spacious by Paris standards. And in the bedroom, pulled off my wig and boots, collapsed on the bed, and fell asleep. Two hours later, I woke with a start. It was late afternoon. Back home, it was the middle of the night. I made coffee with the stash in the cupboard, pulled back the curtains on the French doors, walked out onto the wrought iron balcony with its potted red geranium still blooming, and looked down on Grinnell. Two women on the corner talked and smoked while their small dogs sniffed each other. On the dining room table, I spread out the papers from my file on the Frenchman. He lived off Rue de Commerce. Commerce. On my burner phone, I Google mapped the address. Before I left Oregon, while planning my revenge, I struggled with how to meet the Frenchman. From working in the criminal justice system, I'd recognized that the more complicated a defense or prosecution, the greater the possibility of losing a case. Don't confuse jurors with facts. It pisses them off. Go with an emotional appeal or story. So I made my decision. Create a cover story, call the Frenchman, and set up a meeting, appeal to his sense of being French, establish trust and need, maybe even desire, if I could pull that off. All I needed was a disguise, a cover story, something the Frenchman would swallow, nothing too fancy. That's the beginning of it. Oh, yeah, I like the chessboard is set. <laughs> Game on. That's right. <laughs> Give me that checkerboard floor. There you go. <laughs> that is cool. awesome. Thank you. Okay, now Valerie, it's my turn. And I'm gonna okay. start I'm gonna start with a question that you asked me about revenge in Paris. Did you see it coming? So to me, this was the perfect noir because reading it, I felt like something just wasn't right. As I was reading, I sort of felt like I was groping along in the fog or the darkness, but I couldn't put my finger on what wasn't right. And then at the end, wow. But then looking back in hindsight, it was all there and it could have been predicted, yet it hit me unexpected. So how do you write in such a way to keep that outcome a surprise, but yet the reader still feels like you're not withholding anything? Oh, <laughs> well, that is a question for all time. Um, I think different writers use different approaches. My approach with this, and possibly because I have read so much noir and, and watched so many film noir movies, it's sort of imprinted in me that if you develop the story and the characters in a way that have enough realism and you know, I always say this when I'm working with my writers group you either feel like you're in the shoes of the protagonist or you're not in the shoes of the protagonist if you're not in the shoes of the protagonist it's not going to go not going to go well so I had to take on Angeline as or Ange as I call her fully and part of her is me. It's just she takes things a little far. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so part of it is I wanted a woman who really wanted justice in whatever way. And after working in the I, – as I developed her, I realized she'd been disenchanted with the way the justice system actually worked and 
found herself in a situation where it's actually turned against her because of other other people's motivations and needs and desires. So she, in a way, becomes her own criminal justice system. So part of it for me is I just had to let her go. I just had to, I actually was surprised by the ending myself. Oh. I was quite sure where she was going. And when I got there, I realized, oh my God, now I know what's oh, happened. That's awesome. And it, yeah, it's scary though. It's also scary. You know how when you write like, you know, mysteries and thrillers, everything has to be there. Yeah. I mean, not that you can't go back and put things in there to kind of, you know, plant them, but planting them often feels like they're planted. So exactly. I, so what I wanted to do was just to see if I could pull it off. And the first, I mean, it's not like I don't rewrite some of these things if they don't work, but on the next one, which is called Portland Prey, Angeline is about six months ahead of where she leaves off here. And her whole life has just gone to hell in a handbasket. And she's having to do some pretty out of her norm types of things to, you know, her new desires and her new needs and her new, you know, and some, you know, all of the other things that are affecting her come to play. And it's getting harder to write because, of course, you're making it more complex because she's more complex. She's having to look at herself and say, God, what did I do? And how did I do that? And, you know. Yeah. So, you know, those types of questions come up because, as I say in later, and I'm not giving anything away because I'm still killing people off, um, that... <laughs> <laughs> part of and it we is, love that about you. <laughs> it's also the it's also a point you know where I'm thinking of other people I'd like to kill off. But anyway, in reality, <laughs> but anyhow, um, part of it is is I'm getting more political too, and I'm getting I'm reflecting our times in a in in the noir tradition, and getting some things in there from the point of view of a woman. And what she's forced to do in order to not only stay alive, but also to deal with her own feelings. So there's, you know, there's a lot in there. Um, that's, I, I, that's all I can say about it. It's, it's hard to explain to most people. I mean, I don't want to get woo-woo, but it's kind of like, if my character walks off the stage and sits down and won't do anything, I know I have, there's something wrong that I haven't, you know, I haven't, I haven't really stood in her shoes. So so what are some of the critical attributes that you want yourself to write into your protagonist? Well, the critical attributes are actually what how does how does how do emotions and rationale you know, they tend to fight with each other. Um so that's what we that's you know, your brain can be telling you anything. And there, I think there's a great quote from somebody who said something about, you know, that if you have the brain and the emotions working, you know, at an even level, you know, the emotions are going to win out. And this yes. is exactly those, those critical attributes. I want to get into my protagonist is how is she fighting these in a way, sometimes base desires or just her own, her, let's put it this way, you know what we call the, um, uh, the wounds from the past and all that. Mm. Her things yes. in the past that have caused her to be the way she is. And we'll find out more about that in the next, in, in Portland Prey. Oh. And then the, the third one is set in Hawaii, in Hawaii, Maya. Oh. Um, cool. Yeah. And you'll find, you'll find out even more because she really is not conscious of what is doing this to her. She is, she's like a woman on a mission and then she gets stuck in her own, you know, well, like we all do, you, uh, you do something that you you may either regret or you can't live with and you have to start, you know, over. <laughs> so, so I guess those attributes are, I still want to keep her strong. I still want to keep her, but I want to make her wiser as she goes along. 
and also I want to have her see what's affecting her and be conscious of it because I don't know about you, but I know when I was young, I thought I could save everybody. Huh. I was always trying to save my friends and my family members and at the expense sometimes of myself. And what would happen with that is I realized I really was just distracting myself from doing what I needed to do. Well, I'll tell you, one of the things I really like in your story is that it's contemporary, even though I love the old, like, 1940s noir movies. But it seems that noir can stretch to fit many time periods and many settings. So what is it about this subgenre that makes it so flexible? And do you feel that noir's popularity is in a resurgence? Oh, big questions. It's definitely in a resurgence. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I turn around and someone is saying noir this, noir that. I mean, I think, like I said, because we feel like we're in a dark time, look what just happened, you know, in um, Las Vegas, and no one feels safe anymore. And thematically with noir, uh, the dominant moods are cynicism, uh, despair, uh, paranoia, uh, disenchantment, um, sometimes claustrophobia because you feel like you can't go anywhere. Uh, so many of these, um, how, how much have you heard about people feeling fear, a great amount of fear? So yeah. I think that, you know, that's, that is something that resonates with people when you write about it because, uh, the, the, the the genre is flexible due to the fact that even though I'm setting it in a contemporary time, I've pared down the language as much as possible so that it's more in the vein of the old stylists, um, like Kane and um, you know Hughes. That that when you when you pare it down and you and you and it's there's a tone and a language so it makes it feel like it's like you know like the old you know like the old noir hmm. and the you know it's more like you know sh you know gunshots going off and there's a lot of short sentences and um the dialogue is snappy and you know there's there's not a lot of self introspection you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> right so you don't go into a lot of uh Oh, you know, these sort of esoteric, you know, paragraphs <laughs> of, you know, why I think this is happening, you know. <laughs> so I love it that it is snappy like that. And I love playing with dialogue. That's like one of my favorite things to do. Interesting. Your question? Yeah, that's really interesting. And, you know, the noir protagonists are they're self-destructive and they're driven by those tough emotions, revenge and greed and lust. And sometimes, I mean, I love that. And then also sometimes it just so frustrates me. Um, <laughs> and the way that you're writing your story, I found myself, even though I was frustrated with some of these characters, I was empathizing with them and just hoping that they would succeed how are you working in your writing to pull that reaction from me? Well, I think it goes back to something I was saying before, and that is if you have a character who is really three-dimensional and full-blown as in a, in a life, not someone that, you know, like what we call the stereotypes. If you have someone who has a desire I mean, who doesn't have a desire for justice? Yeah. That's you great. know, who, you know, and, and in this, you'll find that, you know, Ange has protected her sister for years and years. And little by little, you'll understand how she became so obsessed with doing that. So for me, you have to have a, um, I mean, it's not necessarily, you know, the, the dark side at first. It could just come out of a, you know, hey, you're lusty after somebody. You're really, you know, you're really hot for this person and nothing wrong with that, you know. But if you're getting caught in a trap and you're too stupid to see it, <laughs> then you, 
you know, then you have a problem. But with Ange, it's all really like most women. We often do things and think that it's the right thing to do yeah. and really put out of uh, out of a motive that isn't self aggrandizing or so we think. But then later we find out that motive really came out of a need to fulfill something in ourselves and also to make up for something that we may, you know, uh, you know, like going to Hedgebrook. Did I know I was a writer going to Hedgebrook? No. Did I feel like I was on the same level with the rest of the women? No. Did I, did I feel at some point that I'd been given this great gift? Yes. Could I pull it off? Could I really do it? You know, all those questions. Um, we don't come into this with a, you know, full bore confidence. So I think with thrillers, you look at people as you have, you have the guys on, or the women and men on the side who are full of confidence and they're really, you know, this is what they're going to do. And, you know, and they have all the tools to do it. And, you know, and then you find out that you're up against uh, some pretty, you know, nasty people who are, have tools and also no conscience. So, you know, it's like very true. Tough so combination. Those, it's a tough combination. And, and in cozies, you're looking at, someone who just wants to find out who the killer is or who the person is that, you know, and help say, for example, just a small town, you know? Yeah. It, it, it's all about safety and, and knowing that it's going to be okay at the end and that you're going to solve the mystery. So that's a sense of, Oh, you know, that gives you a sense of, of fulfillment noir doesn't necessarily tap you know tap into that it taps no. <laughs> the zeitgeist of the you know of the uh, of society definitely well we talked a little bit about like the lighting and and so forth in in the noir movies but in in your books what part does setting play in your noir well, as you know, and, and we, we talked about, um, I decided to combine noir in my travels because when I went to Paris in 2015-16, um, I, I was taken with the fact that, yeah, I was there for Christmas, but it was right after all the horrible um, terrorist attacks in November. Yeah. Um, yeah. And my, my family was going, oh, you sure you should go, still go, you really, maybe you shouldn't go, you know, and, and I thought, well, what better, safer time, you know, there, there were 10,000 um, soldiers on the street when we went, so there was a sense of almost discord underlying it all, but people, that's what I felt was above all of that, people were, we aren't going to, we aren't going to be backed down by this. You know, when I went to, when we were at the Eiffel Tower, there were, there was a Muslim family next to us. There was a, you know, an African family on the other side. There were, everybody was there to celebrate and not, and not show fear. And I was just so proud to be there at that time. But also the, the dichotomy of the feeling of you're not safe and then we're not going to put up with this. It just, I said, oh, this would make a great noir setting. And that's when I started writing noir. I mean, I'd been writing before that, but as my lit chicks group, my writing group said, oh, you found your niche. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, it, I think it was a perfect setting, definitely. And speaking about your lit chicks group, can, can you tell us a little bit more about that and, and about the importance of belonging to a writing group or a writing community? Well, it's pretty simple in my book. Um, writing is an isolated, uh, endeavor. And if you're just constantly sitting at home and in your head, which my husband always finds very funny because I have to, when I come out with a certain look on my face, he knows not to bother me. Um, and I'm sure you have similar things with friends. Like if, if I'm, if I'm at a cafe, I have, my face says, do not disturb. You know? <laughs> so I just find that 
my group is, I think we've been together 15 years and we've all published and we help each other with that too. But what works for us is that there are times when, say for example, even with my noir, I'll lose the voice a bit and they'll catch it. And they'll say, oh, I'm kind of, I'm kind of losing the voice on Ange, you know, mm -hmm. and I'll find it was, it's the language that I was using and I got a little, you know, carried away in a different stream. So those are the types of things like we all have our strengths and it all works to an incredible, and I, we're all scared that something's going to happen to one of us. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's like the it's like the the three fates. You know, <laughs> you're just you're tied to each other in such a way that there's nobody else who understands you like they do. So, it's a great group. That's beautiful. Well, yeah. thank you so much for all the brilliant resource links and information about Paris and and more at the end of Revenge in Paris. Your book is so well researched and. And what a wonderful bonus for readers to have that is. <laughs> so now I'm going to be sneaky. Is there anything else, <laughs> anything else that you can tell us about your next noir, Portland Prey? And when is oh, it available? Oh, I am so excited about Portland Prey. Um, I'm hoping to put it up this week um, on all ebook platforms. Um, and just to let, you know, your audience know, once I finish the Hawaii one, I will put the three of them together for a print book. Oh, so, great. So that way they can read it, you know, they can read it that way. I know a lot of people aren't on ebooks, so, but that's okay. But I, do you have time to let me read you something real quickly? It's just a short paragraph. Yeah, give us an excerpt. Yeah, it'd be great. Sure. Well, this isn't an excerpt. This actually will tell your, I was very excited. I asked for blurbs you know, or testimonials. And I received one from Tim Applegate who wrote Fever Tree, which is a fabulous atmospheric mystery set in Florida. And Tim wrote this, and this, I'm reading this due to the fact that if I talk about Portland Prey, I probably give away something and I shouldn't. So, so here's what he said. Portland Prey is a swift, seductive, menacing tale of extortion and murder that assuredly carries forward revenge in Paris. Valerie Brooks' scintillating debut installment in her noir travel story series. Like the great James M. Cain, Brooks strips her story down to the bare essentials, effortlessly blending classic noir, an urban setting, unexpected narrative detours, a suspicious money trail, with uniquely modern components, including a professional computer hacker, Snapchat, and the Ashley Madison dating site. With <laughs> With its breakneck pace, intriguing cast of characters, and unabashed eroticism, Portland Prey is a wild, wicked, and utterly delightful ride. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> when I start getting nervous, I, I walk around the house reading that to myself. So <laughs> Good. Good. Love that. Uh, yeah, it's great. Love that. Well, I attended a writing workshop last month by one of my favorite writing mentors, Donald Moss, called The Emotional Craft of Fiction, and it's based on his book of the same name. I think one thing that really stands out for me in reading noir or seeing noir films is that the protagonist usually starts from a really dark place, hence the noir name. Now, protagonists are motivated by revenge, lust, desire or desire for justice at all costs, as, as you've certainly mentioned, Valerie. And this makes it all the more challenging for a writer to craft a character who can make that leap from darkness, which is something most readers really want to see or experience. Some writers refer to it as the inner journey, the transformative arc or growth. But what readers want, according to Donald Moss, is a character who starts as one kind of person and becomes another, or in some novels, becomes at least a slightly better version of themselves. And another thing that stands out for me is that many of these complex, damaged characters who operate in the shadows have a set of moral standards that they adhere to. 
their standards may not coincide with ours. They may be warped or slightly twisted, but that makes them all the more engaging to read about, doesn't it? Unlike some thrillers, especially those with an espionage or military setting, emotion is an important and essential component of the noir segment of fiction. Skilled writers like Valerie build those elements into their characters from the very first word to keep us reading. Sure do. Sure. That sounds like it was a great uh, workshop. It was wonderful. I got so much out of it. I highly recommend it. He's phenomenal. I, I agree with you, Julie, because I've been to one of his workshops. And I mean, even if you buy his books, you, know, you get a great deal out of it. But he's a big supporter of writers, that's for sure. He absolutely is. Well, my segment for this episode comes from the 1944 noir movie, Laura. So the title of my segment is, I can afford a blemish on my character, but not on my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I think noir, the old noir have some of the greatest quotes. And I wonder why I'm so excited to immerse myself in the noir world, where I feel like I have to leave behind all hope. This is a long commute from my beloved cozy mystery community. Noir is the neighborhood of broken dreams, buried morals, and lost hope. The plot revolves around a crime, either committed or plotted or in progress, and likely a doomed relationship between two desperate people. <laughs> a typical undercurrent is a slowly revealed pattern of self-destructive behavior on the part of the main character, sometimes leaving the reader scratching your head and silently begging the character to snap out of it. Then, when the situation is all wrapped up, it's in desperation. As the character Kathy asks in a movie, 1947 noir movie, Out of the Past, she asks, is there a way to win? And Jeff responds, there's a way to lose more slowly. Oh. <laughs> I'm, in awe, I'm in awe of what keeps these characters going. How do they keep moving when there's despair instead of hope? When I feel like all else is failing, I live on hope. Hope that something will go away. Hope that I can do better. Hope that things will be better. Hope that I can get through it. I'm fascinated by a character who's devoid of hope, headed for eventual ruin. What's going through that character's mind? I think it's not the mind that drives these characters. I see them propelled completely on emotion reacting left and right in emotional, internal outbursts. And those build within the character and explode in ruinous actions. Continually, I'm begging the character to pause, think first. But no, they continue to react. And then I despair. As Humphrey Bogart's character says in Key Largo, when your head says one thing and your whole life says another, your head always loses. <laughs> there it is. This is a wonderful subgenre to discover. As with so much of the mystery genre, at the heart of the noir story is not the fascinating mystery, it's the characters. And as with other mystery subgenres, I analyze and also see what I can learn from these noir characters. How do I open my eyes to my own character flaws and patterns of behavior? I want to indulge in the enjoyment of reading noir. I don't want to be noir. <laughs> <laughs> so well, it's a good, good thing you write cozies. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, in all our episodes, we like to recommend stories in addition to our guests writing. So Valerie, we'll start with you. Do you have a recommendation for us? I do. Um, I'm recommending... Um, actually, I'm breaking the rules. I'm recommending two. Because, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just finished, after Tim Applegate gave me that wonderful blurb, I read his Fever Tree. Um, and I just loved it. And, and, and you and both of you will because it's neither thriller nor, it, I would call it suspense, but it has a, it has a romance 
component to it, which is always nice. Great, great characters like the name Teddy Mink, um, you know, that that are like the town's notorious paranoid drug lord. And it's <laughs> set in this just atmospheric, small, you know, Florida, muggy, hot town, which always makes for great atmosphere in a noir. And when you're when you're there it's just you do you you, you're again you're rooting for the characters and you don't know why and you don't even know the main protagonist and why he's there so it's an interesting read and he's also a poet so the language is gorgeous so that yeah and so i love beautiful language and that just drew me but for anyone who um is not familiar with noir and read a lot of the male writers who are all fabulous. I, I love Ross McDonald because he's so funny. But um, Dorothy B. Hughes is the place to start. If you've seen the noir movie In a Lonely Place with Bogey, this novel is such a great way to see how a movie is condensed and compressed to get the same feel across the same characters but doesn't necessarily follow the same you know, winding path that yeah. is in the novel. And the novel is just, if you, unfortunately I knew that I knew how it ended cause I've seen the movie. So, but it still just grabs me because it's so fascinating from a psychological point of view. You'll really understand how psychopaths and narcissists actually operate in the world without being seen before they're caught in something dastardly <laughs> so so that those are my two recommendations oh those are great okay i great. put them on my list <laughs> you have a long list <laughs> we both do yeah <laughs> Well, my recommendation is titled Agent Zigzag, A True Story of Nazi Espionage, Love, and Betrayal. It's written by Ben McIntyre. And I'm going to start out by asking, do you like spy thrillers? Well, this book is the real thing. This is the true accounting of the self-serving but also heroic adventures of Eddie Chapman as a double agent during World War II. He was a British citizen with an interesting and somewhat noir personal history. Despite his checkered past, he volunteered for the British spy service, arguably as a way to save himself from his self-destructive life. With his criminal record, his offer was not taken up by MI5 at that time. Then he turned traitor, volunteering to spy for the Nazis. Once accepted by the Nazis, He then ended up as a double agent for the British. Chapman would say that it was always his intent to work for the British, and that may be, or he may have seized an opportunity that came his way, as he did so often in his life. His story and reading about his adventures is enthralling and somewhat real-life noir. You'll learn a lot about the people and the workings of the Nazi Secret Service in this book, Chapman was one of the first initiates in the Nazis' ambitions to turn allies, citizens, into their own spies. You'll read about Chapman's training and about secrets he discovered for the British during his private training by the Nazis in France. When Chapman was deemed by the Nazis to be ready and fully tested regarding his loyalties, he was dangerously parachuted back to Britain on a mission for the Nazis. Then you get to read about Chapman immediately turning himself over to service as a double agent for MI5, Britain's secret service, who gave him the code name Zigzag. You'll meet the people he worked with there, including the man that Ian Fleming modeled Q after in the James Bond books. The book details how Chapman and his MI5 handlers dangerously but successfully fooled the Nazis. Chapman is a charming and likable personality with a criminal personal life before becoming a double agent spy. He loves deeply and often, and you'll read all about the fascinating and brave women who are attracted to him and one who spies with him. 
The story paints him with many tendencies that reflect a noir. He's an outsider, outcast. He comes from a background where he feels he's a loser with no one who cares, and he carries a sense of alienation. He's driven by greed, lust, and revenge in much that he does. Yet he invokes empathy in the reader. He's his own worst enemy, and he inhabits a very dark, unsettling, and violent world. Ben McIntyre, the author, is British. He's an historian and columnist for the Times of London newspaper. He's fully researched the topic, including exhaustive numbers of confidential files finally released by the British government in 2002, and also videotaped recollections by Chapman himself before he died in 1997. And also there's interviews with the surrounding characters in Chapman's life. Julie, what have you got for us? Well, I've really gotten back into historical mysteries of late for some reason. Um, maybe it is a retreat from current politics and the violence in our society. I don't know. But my, my recommendation today is called A Free Man of Color by Barbara Hambly, and it's the first in a wonderful series. It's set at Mardi Gras in 1833 New Orleans, and our protagonist is Benjamin January. He's a free man of color who is a classical musician and was also educated and trained as a surgeon, one who worked in Paris before returning to his childhood home of New Orleans. She not only paints a revealing portrait of the rigid social stratifications of white or French Creole society, but describes the layers of black society in that culture as well. From the free people of color to the quadroons and octoroons, the slaves, and even a voodoo queen or two. Then there are the Americans, mostly uncouth, uneducated river boatmen from Kentucky, regarded by the Louisianans as barbarians, and they live up to that description. She's done an amazing amount of research which is effortlessly blended in giving us some insights into why race and racial identity is still such a troubling subject in America today. Benjamin sets out to protect a friend and investigate the murder of a young woman of color during Mardi Gras. She's a no no notorious octroon who is hated by almost everyone who knew her. And yet he'll risk his freedom and his life to uncover the truth and learn that he may be someone's perfect scapegoat for the crime. The Chicago Tribune called this book magically rich and poignant. Barbara Hamley, through her research and her writing, makes this time period come vividly to life and also gives us a great twist at the end. That's it for another segment of Kendall and Cooper Talk Mysteries. We'd like to thank our special guest, writer Valerie J. Brooks, for joining us and telling us about her work and her writing process. Valerie, we're waiting for more mysteries a la Francaise, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> thank you for joining us. And keep reading and keep writing. Mm -hmm.